So the study of uh, this nonlinear dispersive equations it took, took off basically in this late 70s and 80s where many properties of uh, special solutions such as traveling waves were uh, discovered, sometimes rigorously and sometimes not. And uh, I guess in the late 80s and uh, early 90s, with uh, my collaborators Ponce and Vega, we uh, described a way of using the modern tools of harmonic analysis to study the nonlinear problems as perturbations of the linear problems that could be uh, analyzed by Fourier's method. And uh, we extended many of these properties to nonlinear equations. There's been a, a lot of progress on these equations since. Many people have been involved in this. And there's these are some names for those of, of you who are mathematicians, Burgen, Tao, Tataro, Kleiner, and Macedon, and many others. And what this was able to accomplish using basically harmonic analysis is a very satisfactory understanding of the short time well posedness of these equations and for a long time, the well posedness for very small solutions. And it was at this time that the notion of criticality arose. Criticality is an important notion in nonlinear analysis, and it's not a fixed notion. Criticality has to do with the groups of invariances that act on the solutions of the equation. And it depends on what property of these groups you look at that you can define a different notion of criticality. And the notion of criticality that arose here had to do with scaling, with looking at things mi microscopically or macroscopically or telescopically, let's say. So, uh, so this is a, another uh, promotional uh, slide. Uh, the, the thing that became of interest in the last 15 or 20 years is the understanding of global properties where you cannot use perturbations of the nonlinear equations by the linear equations so that you cannot really use harmonic analysis, uh, at least in a direct manner. So what do you do? Well, there was a, a, a beginning of this in, in work that I did with Frank Merle about, I don't know, roughly 12 years ago, uh, in which we introduced a method which uh, allowed us to understand in a better way the nonlinear effects that cause the existence of solitary waves. But our ultimate goal in this method was to study the problem of asymptotic soliton resolution. So uh, I'll go back to this now. And this will be the next uh, part of the talk where I'm going to speak about a simplification that is uh, effective in this nonlinear problems because of the existence of these traveling waves, these truly nonlinear objects. OK? Yes? Yes, th this is correct. But uh, this was used for dispersive equations for the first time here. OK? Is there any other comment? OK. OK. So uh, what we wanted to study is something that is more of a philosophy than a, than a theorem, which originates in the mathematical physics community. 
which is the, uh, the, the belief that the long time asymptotic behavior of arbitrary solutions of arbitrary dispersive equations is given by coherent structures and free radiation. And uh, this is, a, this should describe this long time asymptotic behavior. And this belief is what's come to be known as the soliton resolution conjecture. So the soliton resolution conjecture is not really a conjecture, but a belief. And in, in every specific instance, it becomes an actual conjecture once you formulate it precisely. Okay. So what this says is that asymptotically in time, the evolution of a generic uh, solution decouples as a sum of mo modulated solitons, which are traveling wave solutions, a solution that is called the free radiation, which is an, a dispersive term, which does go down in time in size, solving the linear equation. And so why is this a simplification? What happens with these very complex nonlinear evolutions is th the solution starts evolving, and for a while, you, for a very short time, it starts behaving like a linear solution. But then after a while, it comes into an intermediate regime where you really cannot see what it's doing. It's like in a black box that you cannot peer into. But if you wait long enough, then you can see it come out of this box as a sum of solitary waves plus a solution to the linear equation, plus a small error. And so asymptotically in time, you get a formula for the solution. You get an asymptotic formula in terms of these nonlinear objects, which take care of the part that is nonlinear, and then a linear term that takes care of the rest. So that's what this postulates. Of course, it's easy to say this, but then since we are mathematicians, we try to prove something like this. Okay. So this is the second simplification I, I wanted to discuss. So, um, oh, sorry. So, so here comes a very, what to me is a very interesting story. What made people think that this was possible? So th the story really started uh, at the end of World War II at Los Alamos. So uh, at Los Alamos, of course, they built the nuclear bombs that they used to uh, end the war in Japan in the East. And and there was a large congregation of scientists at Los Alamos at the time. And one of the things that they did in order to actually manufacture these this bombs was construct a computer. So they constructed a, a, one of the first computers, which allowed them to do the huge calculations that they needed to do. This computer was called the Maniac. And uh, so after the war, Fermi, who was still uh, at Los Alamos at the time, decided that there should be a good use for, for this machine. That, uh, in fact, this machine should be, it should be possible to use it for theoretical purposes. Fermi was a professor at the University of Chicago, by the way. Anyway, so, uh, so what he decided is that they were, he was going to try to conduct a, a, a computer experiment of a mathematical problem that 
tested if some physical law, but which you couldn't really calculate by hand. But by doing this numerical simulation, you could get an idea of what you of what was going on. And this thought of Fermi is really the beginning of scientific computation. And that's, that was the effect of this observation of, uh, of Fermi's. And so uh, he, with uh, Ulam and uh, Pasta, Pasta w was a computer expert. Ulam was another one of the people who worked on the bombs at Los Alamos. He was an applied mathematician and a topologist. And uh, so what they decided to try out was understanding how a vibrating string with a nonlinear term, with a nonlinear effect, behaves. And they decided to put quadratic or cubic nonlinearities into this. And the, the physical intuition that they had was that the nonlinearity should cause some kind of equirepartition of energy, which meant that all the Fourier modes, if you start out with something which had just one Fourier mode, if you waited long enough, all the Fourier modes should be touched and the energy should be equally spread out among all these Fourier modes. That was Fermi's conjecture, and this was uh, called ergodic behavior. And uh, they did the experiment, and this did not happen. And Fermi called this a minor discovery. And what happened was that instead, the energy got kept being concentrated at the same mode. So what, they, what this means is they solved for cosine x <laughs> and, and showed that the solution, most of its energy was still concentrated in the first mode as time evolved for a very long time. And uh, this was a paradox that they couldn't resolve. And they published this in the Los Alamos report. And by the time this was published, Fermi had already died. Like uh, most of his team, he died early from cancer. Um, and uh, for many years, this was not explained. Now, an interesting anecdote is that there was a fourth author of this experiment, who is the person that did the programming, whose name was Mary Tsingu, and her name disappeared from the story. So you can draw your own conclusions about this. <laughs> okay. I think there are two possible explanations. One is the obvious one. The other one is that they didn't think that people who did the actual coding we're at the same level as the authors. OK, so the, it is unclear which one of the two explanations is, is the correct one. So uh, this thing was taken up uh, about 10 years later, in the mid-60s, by uh, Kruskal and then by Kruskal and Zavuski. And Kruskal made a very, very interesting observation. He observed, and now by then, uh, numerical experiments were much more common, and the machines were much better. But Kruskal made a theoretical uh, uh, observation. He said he, the way that they had solved this nonlinear vibrating st string was by uh, discretization. They put in many, many points and solved finite differences instead of derivatives, and just solved that by computational methods. So what, what Kruskal uh, was able to do is that if you, he calculated the limit as the mesh goes to 0. And when you calculate the limit as the mesh goes to 0, you actually get the correct Ries equation. And it's the the existence 
of solitary waves for the correct Debris equation that explains the Fermi Pasta Ulam paradox. <coughs> then he conducted, an, uh, Kruskal conducted another very interesting uh, numerical experiment with Zabuski. Now, here, too, there was a third party involved who did the coding. This third party was a man, and the name also has been dropped from history. So uh, the jury is out as to what really happened with this. Anyway, in the uh, Zabuski Kruskal uh, numerical experiment, two things happened. Two things that, to my mind, are very important. The first was that they solved the correct Debris equation which, with the nonlinearity, uh, quadratic nonlinearity, for data cosine x, just like Fermi Pastagula. And they observed that for a very long time, at ver for a very long time, when you waited a very long time, the solution decomposed into this sum of translated and rescaled solitons going at different speeds. And that's where the soliton resolution conjecture originates in this computation of Zabuski and Kruskal to explain the Fermi Pasta Ulam experiment. Uh, the second thing that they observed is that as time evolved, the solitons were traveling at different speeds, and some caught up with others. And the moment they, they caught up, you could, would expect that something would explode in some way, or the, the things would crash, or something strange. But no, nothing like this happened. The one that was going faster took over the one that was going slower and emerged unchanged. So the, the solitons interacted as if they were linear, the, their interaction was linear. And this uh, is called, uh, at the moment of collision and later, and this is what we call elastic uh, collisions. Okay. And I lost my thing. Okay. So this is the background for the soliton resolution conjecture, this numerical experiment. So I think it's actually fascinating how the advent of the computer age led to really interesting mathematical conjectures and led to scientific computing and modeling, which is one of the main uh, most important activities nowadays. So this soliton resolution conjecture is, has been, since the 70s, one of the holy grails in the subject of uh, <coughs> dispersive equations. Now, the only cases in which it had been solved until very recently were cases where the nonlinear equations were actually what we call integrable. So th this means that the nonlinear equations can be reduced to a a countable family of linear equations. And for those equations, in particular for the correct Debris equations of powers two and three, like uh, Kruskal and Zabuski did, for the uh, one of the Schrodinger equations and so on, uh, people were able to prove the soliton resolution conjecture. But even in this integrable case, these were very difficult results. The one for the Schrodinger equation it was heuristically solved in the 80s, and mathematically, there was a paper in the archive this year, 2018. So anyway, but then uh, the, the quest really became to understand what happens with soliton resolution in non-integrable cases when you don't have this linear machinery to do this. And uh, just to give you an idea, in 2006, in his 
lecturer at the International Congress of Mathematicians, Avi Sofer said that nobody had any idea how to do this for any integrable equation, for any non-integrable equation. So we're very far from proving such a result for any interesting equation. Okay. So, uh, and uh, in a series of works starting around 2013, uh, still ongoing with uh, Decaire and Merle, we have managed to actually do this for a very uh, non-trivial example of non-integrable model, which is the energy critical wave equation. So I'll just show you what this is. But first, uh, let me explain what is believed to be the mechanism for this decomposition. So there's a physical mechanism that's believed to take place that makes this decomposition possible. And it's the fact that as you evolve, energy, the energy is conserved, so it cannot disappear, but it's pushed towards uh, spatial infinity. And that's why this decomposition is happening. Now this is observed in experiments. Okay. And uh, it ha for instance, in the dynamics of gas bubbles in a compressible fluid, you can see this in the lab. And in a in the formation of black holes and the gravitational collapse, it also happens, but of course this you can only see in a computer. Nobody has seen a black hole. <laughs> okay. So, um, and the way we were able to do this is by finding a way to quantify this ejection of energy. So, uh, I don't have that much time. Uh, so I will not torture you by showing you a theorem. <laughs> Maybe I'll put it up, but not <laughs> say too much about it. So here are two theorems. I'll give you soliton resolution. The last one is one where we know that this soliton resolution happens instead of for all times for well-chosen sequences of times. And we've been working very hard in, in trying to prove this for all sequences of times. But what is interesting in here is the connection with the zabuski kruskal experiment. Because what we need to do in order to, to, to prove this for all times now is to understand the collisions of solitary waves. Now, in non-integrable cases, the collisions of solitary waves are much more complicated. What we expect is that they collide and they re-emerge, but when they re-emerge, there's some extra energy that goes into radiation. And that's uh, what we need to capture in order to be able to pass from proving this theorem for some sequence of times to all sequences of times. And in the two years since this slide was prepared, there's been some progress in that we now understand all soliton collisions in radial situations. Okay, so we understand that always energy is moved out in the form of radiation when they collide. Anyway, so I hope that this gives you a flavor of some of these things. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Okay, well, if not, let's thank uh, Carlos again. Thank you.